believe it or not, I actually have a theme that I want to go over. I actually have a theme today. I'm not just looking over two really cool games. There's actually a theme involved here. So that's interesting. I'll have to look it up later. I'm not entirely certain. Uh, suffice it to say, you might recognize who Black is. Black is a fairly young, fairly strong Chinese professional player. So that's cool. White, I'm not certain. I knew like an hour beforehand, and I've forgotten because I'm stupid. So I'm sorry about that. I'll have to look it up later. Um, but yes, yeah, so we have a theme today in these two games that I want to go over. And that is this really mystical idea of trades and exchanges. Because a lot of us, at some point, we, we do make some kind of trade in our games. Usually we're doing it completely blind. We're not entirely certain, you know, what the value of what we're trading is. But we've decided that that's, you know, something that you can do and go, that is a tactic. We can trade this for that. And we hope that what we're trading is of greater value. Here we find some very, very interesting trades and some very nervous trades. As in, if you were to actually be trading like they are, you would probably be nervous because of it. I know I certainly would be. So, because I have two games I want to go over, I'm not going to be going over the entire game. I'll let you guys be warned of that now. I will be going over what I find interesting, and I will be giving out links to the games at the end. Those of you watching later on from the YouTubes, you can find it down uh, below. The link to the games, if you want to go over all of them. And I hope you guys enjoy. So... Right off the bat, we have nothing of any uh, difference with our. We have nothing of any uh, difference with our opening. I always do pretty much the same thing. And hello, everyone. I do not go over unorthodox openings. Probably should, but I don't. Thank you for supplying the ranks there, Jessic. So right away, we have opening up with a low Chinese from black. That has been very common for about a year now. Looks like it's not going away anytime soon. A lot of people seem to be playing Chinese variations these days, which is okay. There's a lot of different variations surrounding this particular opening, so it's interesting to explore them. White actually explores it in a way that it's a bit different than what we usually think of in terms of how to handle a low Chinese variation. Because when you think of how to approach a low Chinese variation, how do you how do you go about it? What's the first thing you think of? Mo Boy says N4. Deflo says N4. Both of them are thinking that we need to approach the 3-4 stone, but we are not about to do it in a traditional manner. We want to do it on the outside, see if we can't force an enclosure, and then back off. All of these ideas that I'm seeing, O4, O or Q, yeah, okay, we're all seeing essentially the same thing. Let's approach that freaking 3-4 stone, see if we can't get this Jaseki to shut up back off and go into a normal game. Unfortunately, White actually decides to approach the 3-4 stone, or the 4-4 stone, sorry, rather than the 3-4 stone, which is rather interesting. This is saying, you know what? I get it. You're making the Chinese Fuseki here. That opening is to potentially develop a framework, and I'm okay with that you can continue going along and doing that. I'm willing to fight you on that kind of level. If you want to expand your uh, framework, you can do so. So, all right. Um, white or black responds normally. He just plays uh, Q14. 
there's no reason to do anything creepy here, like pincer or play across on the other side of the board. All we need here is Sentei, because with Sentei, we're going to keep expanding. And we're fine with this. This is exactly what we want to do. White does not back off for a framework, though. White immediately hops into the corner. Interesting choice here. And decides to live. Black connects, white goes under. So now we have, uh, oops, wait, now we're not done yet. Dupe, dupe, and dupe, there we go. So now we have an interesting result. Here, white is doing quite a few things at once. White's trying to reduce, white will live in the corner, yes. White is trying to reduce um, the territory that black's potentially gonna get while also trying to slightly negate some of the influence that black is getting from jumping into the corner. And we really can't kill white. I mean, we can picture, let's say, one forcey move here, right? To connect, followed by an easy eye. So we have really, really easy ways uh, to live in here. Nothing, nothing that we really have to worry about so much. Black does not want to get pushed and cut. But remember, this isn't going to kill because we still have the happy little uh, Q19 ways to make eyes, that kind of, that kind of deal. So white gets another move. Interesting. Interesting so much that it almost seems like, did, did black just get a worse position here? Is that, is that really what happened? It, did this go wrongly for Black? Should he have played something else? Maybe maybe he should have let him just connect up instead of playing this variation? That's the only other uh, option, right? Just go into this instead? And then taking Sentai? But actually, this is actually a rather interesting position for a number of different reasons. For the player who cannot use Aji to save their life, this is going to be very, very bad if you find yourself in Black's position. Because you might see a group here as just being fine and alive and hard to attack. So you might not try, and that would be bad. If we forget that, oh, well, this is still undercut, He's got to be careful about making this kind of exchange, otherwise the corner is in trouble because the Q19 forcing move is gone. Um, there's an opening here at uh, J17. This is this is still a little bit weak. We can't say that uh, we can't do anything here as black because we do have influence, and we've kind of got this really careful way that we can think about using that influence to attack something. So this seems like it's a reasonable result. Black makes an exchange before taking a large point, because even though we have that on the top of the board, what if we attack it and we strengthen, and white just lets us connect back in Gote, but in, uh, yeah. And black is going to back and go to white is going to take a larger move and not care. So we have those weaknesses, but we can't really take advantage all of them, advantage of all of them immediately. A lot of players do that too. They'll just go around and attack things. Their opponent will constantly take larger moves on the board, and then what's going to happen? Well, he's going to break even, or he's actually going to get ahead because he's actually taking the larger moves on the board. Well, you're just trying to poke at these little uh, weaknesses before you know what you want to do with them. As RJM has said, big move is still bigger than unsure attack. Very, very true. So he knows that's there, but he's going to take the large move from the board first, one of which is expanding the framework, like we wanted to do initially. Okay, makes perfect sense. White backs off. And black plays a special move. This is most definitely a special move. What is this special move doing?
eloquently said, what? What is this doing? Yeah, 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 it's expanding to Chinese. That's very, very true. Inviting invasions, also very true. <laughs> Black is making a bit of a a uh, bit of a difficult situation here, because what we know from this, let's actually go back further. What we know uh, from this, I might be able to do that. I'll make a note of that player. Uh, what we know from this is that we want white to approach the 3-4 stone, because he's jumping into a pincer. Now, we could play something like this and play a little bit more standard. Okay, cool. But we also know from this position, it's, it, it's almost standard in a way, you know? I mean, if we find ourselves approaching at A, we know that we have uh, moves like, let's say, um, uh, attachments, perhaps, abilities to kind of make uh, shape here. It's not that unknown to us. If we want something else that's different, we could potentially... Uh, let's see, what could we do? We could potentially see if we can't get Black to uh, defend himself. Maybe lightly before jumping in further. Make it harder to develop this area. We could even do something like cap the low stone in order to reduce the area. This is a bit more set on making it that much more difficult to approach that 3-4 stone while keeping in mind that any kind of move that gets played in the J3 area, the pincer, if white wants to pick one, still can't make a base. So it's a bit difficult to do. We can't just arbitrarily smack a stone down right now at Q5 or try the other normal variations on how you might want to reduce this without really considering how M4 is going to play into it. I like White's decision. White says, I don't care how it's playing into it. I'm going to reduce this huge uh, overextension that you have. I'm going to make things really, really simple on myself. That's cool. I like that idea. Black says, okay, I'm not going to respond to you. And how do we know that I wasn't going to respond to you? Well, it's because I didn't really help F3, I mean, I, there was a uh, potential to do so later, but M4 is centered more around the 3-4 stone and the right side of the board in general, that F3 being under attack is completely fine. The 3-3 three, three is still available. We might bring it out later. There's a lot we can do there. But it's clear that we weren't really interested in F3 when we played M4. So he's just going to reduce uh, Y on the left, make certain he can't get his own framework as well. White kicks, trying to demand a response. If, black, if white responds, then white, or not white, sorry, if black responds, then white can continue attacking. If white continues to attack, he'll get influence in the middle. If he has influence in the middle, he can reduce the framework. All very easy to see. So black says, I'm not going to respond to that. I'm going to make my stone stronger. Like I said, was not interested in F3. That is an exchange that I'm willing to give up. All right, so white kicks, keeps him out of the corner. Black is happy to respond, make sure that he's nice and strong on the left-hand side. Uh, liking that, liking that. White follows up again, and here we really see the value of what black just did. I mean, how many moves has uh, white had to play? against this one stone. He pincered it, he kicked it, he followed up. So that in and of itself is pretty good, 
But keep in mind that that F3 stone is not off the board yet. As a result, it still has some, it still has forcing moves. It still has Aji. So we can think of things like, does the 3-3 three, three still work? If I get a move at K3 later, maybe, is that going to force another response? Or oh, I save my stone? Uh, maybe G4. The Hane here might be good just to reduce it and get some influence. So even though White had to spend three extra moves on here, there's still Aji. And typically, when people think of exchanges, they think of things like this. One stone that we're kind of going to give up because we're going to uh, get profit elsewhere as a result. I think this is the most common form of an exchange that we can make in a game of Go. And probably the most common one that you're going to see in your own games. And naturally from here, uh, we're not going to suddenly defend or try to bring that stone back to life or do anything crazy with it. For now, it's gone. Instead, we're going to play a larger move. And when we think about larger moves, what do we do? How do we decide what's a larger move? How do we do that? For those of you who are completely uh, indecisive, I recommend getting a bunch of darts and just throwing the darts at your monitor and where it hits, you can click there and that will be your move. Let's see, we can do K3, okay. Uh, J60, ooh! I, okay, you've just redeemed yourself, music. You have just redeemed yourself. I was a little bit confused that you would suggest K3 right now. But J16, I like a lot more. It's like, well, we could try and see if we can squeeze a little bit more out of F3, but you know what? Maybe that gets responded to, maybe it doesn't, we don't really know. But what we do know, and I guess this is the line of thought that music had, is what we do know is that there's a weak group on the top of the board. So rather maybe or maybe not getting a response out of K3, why don't we actually attack something that we know White's interested in? And that's the top group on the, to uh, the group on the top of the board. That little weak one that's still undercut. That one's a lot better. I like that idea. Black likes it as well and actually goes deep into J16 or 17, whatever line this is. Uh, J17, Moboy said, seems good. Completely agree. And as, yes, as suggested, if you do throw darts at your monitor, make sure they are suction darts. Do not throw tip darts at your monitor. That would be a bad thing. I am not responsible for you breaking your monitor. All right, so White has to decide what to do. <laughs> <laughs> that actually reminds me of how I, uh, when I was first learning how to play Go, there was, uh, what was his name? I almost want to call him Ren. I forgot who it was. There was this 3Q on a completely different server. Uh, I asked him, how do I find, you know, which, where are the large moves on the board? He didn't recommend... He didn't recommend the whole throwing the darts thing. He actually recommended I stand up, move away from my computer, and just unfocus my eyes. And then the first part of the monitor that I focus on is probably the largest area, and I should put a move there. And like an idiot, I actually followed that for weeks. So that was fun. Uh, but here... How is White actually going to respond? I was like 8Q or something. I was really, really bad. I didn't know anybody. I'm like, okay, is 3Q suggesting it? So I guess that's something. But yeah, how for White to respond here? We don't want to do respond too passively. We could make shape. And I bet a lot of people might be eyeing L18, try to make that little table shape. But if you do that, then white or black just gets to kind of just jorgle his way to freedom, and that's no good. 
So white decides to be a bit more aggressive and cap this stone. It clearly can't go anywhere. Black attaches, seeing if he can't make something happen here. White backs off and backs off. and gets to connect. Easy peasy. Now we could ask ourselves why didn't he play a lot more violent like this? This would be pretty violent. Why didn't he play that way? Well, things get a little bit complicated. Now we have to read out annoying things like cuts. For example, well, does this cut work as is? Uh, kind of looking that way. It's really, really looking like it might. I mean, what do we do? Do we Atari here? And then do we Atari here? And then connect, I guess? I'm not really certain what that bought us besides another weak group, and we still have to play something like this to make certain that white can't connect. But now white's, or that no, black can't connect, rather. But he still can, so I guess we're playing this as well, and now we're completely surrounded, and that's clearly not going to work. Clearly not going to work. So we can't play that way. And white died in the top two. Yeah, that's there's that as well. So the Hane seems incredibly risky. So, no, we just decided to play uh, not that, because that's the incredibly risky variation. Thank you. He decides to just let white connect and get influence instead. So, seeing this result, uh, obvious question, I like that. Is the cap wrong? Well, the cap's not wrong. Uh, the thing is, white's not entirely strong in this position, right? He's already undercut still. He decided to un leave himself undercut in order to take the enclosure. So he's going to pay for that in some fashion, the fact that he's leaving his base so open. Something was going to have to give because of that as a result. Either it was going to be Sente when he fixes his problem, or when it actually is under attack, something's going to, uh, something's going to have to give. So that's pretty much what we're seeing here. I mean, there could have been other options. There could be things like this, for example. But even here, we can still attach here, we can still attach here. There's still even something simple. I mean, there's a lot here that's going to occur. So, it's looking like the most that white can do is get influence out of this, which is what he goes for. B can come from the bottom, correct? I don't know. From the bottom? You mean building up from the bottom? Might be able to. Uh, a bit harder to do now that white has a wall. That's for sure. White moves to make certain there's no shenanigans in this corner. Can black still push and cut? Now there's an interesting question. Well, you can make the attempt to try to push and cut. In fact, let's go back and look and see about that. White, you go somewhere completely different, so we preserve the tree. And let's push and cut. There we go. So can this actually occur? Well, right away, it looks like in and of itself, we can give up two stones in exchange for Sente and being immoral. So we could do that. That's clearly one option. Uh, taking two stones in Gote group is already pretty strong. Not seeing a very, very good reason to do that in and of itself. Instead, Black decides, let's attack it all. We don't want to make this immortal. There are weak points, has been pointed out, the push and the cut, it exists. 
So let's see if we can just poke the shape and see if we can't do something with that. So white says, fine, you do that, I'm going to pressure your three stones. Black uh, throws it in the corner, gets to connect in sente. and then takes a large move for himself, because we have a bit of a risky position here. I mean, we could try and cut, but again, if we lose Sente, white's got a lot of solid points, and black's making certain he's not going to fall behind in territory. So then white gets to go back and attack. Now, is there anything else I really wanted to go through here? Um, the other game is a bit more interesting, so I want to spend my majority of time on that. So I think I actually am going to. Suffice to say, I wanted to pick this game mostly for the bottom left-hand corner, and the fact that that's probably the most common um, way that we typically think of and use exchanges in our own games. If we're making a trade, it's probably something like that. One stone for a development move somewhere else, splitting somewhere else, that kind of thing. What we see in the next game is something a lot more risky, let's say, which also translates into a lot more fun. So I'm going to close this board and put up my next example because I want to spend quite a bit of time on that game because there's a lot of interesting things in there. So I will close this and see you in that one. All right, let's put up a new game. Demonstration. Start recording my voice. Going black screen. Oh, wait, no, we are good to go. It hooked up immediately. Awesome. I like how that just comes together. Ah, clean my mouse real quick. One second. Sorry about that. And let's put this other game up. Put up the players. Type them in real quick. Alright. These players might be a little bit more uh, known. We have a Korean versus a Chinese game. And usually when we have... Uh, players of two different countries fighting it out. They do make for some inter for a bit more interesting games than rather just looking at domestic ones. But yes, this does feature quite some interesting ideas in regards to uh, exchanges on the board. And like the previous one, we don't see anything at all weird. We're seeing just normal, normal stuff. Potentially another low Chinese. Oh my god, is he going to play it? Is he going to play it? Is he going to play it? I don't know. Um, that other game, if you want to go over it, you are more than welcome to do so as soon as I give you the link, which I will have to do later because I closed it. But suffice to say, we don't actually have a low Chinese here. Black does a lot more fun, and he approaches. Good for him, because that would have been annoying to have to see another game like that. Immediately, white ignores. Yep, we do have a low approach, but we don't have low Chinese. Um, immediately, white ignores and approaches black back, so we know that we're in for a very common game. Or not a common, a complicated game, sorry. Uh, why low is a very good question. Essentially, you have two different options here. Uh, you could play high. High is a bit more territorial. Um, 
Or not territorial. Wow, I'm getting so tongue-tied this game. High is more influential rather than uh, low being more territorial. And believe it or not, despite what you probably see more often here on KGS, we do see a low approach a bit more common than we do see high in professional play. Simply because, well, I don't know, there's a lot of reasons for it. But one of the reasons is because it's easier to uh, develop something. It's not risky for influence. High is faster, but again, high is typically more for influence, and you have to be careful with that. It's just preference, though. Either's fine. But low is good. White approaches high. Black ignores and approaches black again. Or approaches white again. Oh my god, I'm not getting these colors right ever. So right away, complicated game. We have to decide what are we going to do. Because as white, we really can play anywhere we want. We could approach the upper right, we can follow up the lower left, we can do something in the lower left, the upper left. I mean, anything that we want to do, really, we could do. White decides to try to put some simplicity back into the game, and he protects his corner. Okay, no, we can't do 10 again. We can almost do anything. Black has Sente, responds by a pincering the 3-4 uh, stone, the 3-4 approach, rather. White responds by ignoring and separating the left-hand side, because white knows that ideally black would like to get some sort of development going in here whether it's from developing a wall and trying to use it this way or just trying to play another move to connect everything up in some fashion black typically wants another move over there so he decides you know what i'm going to play that instead so right away we have a game where we're threatening to make exchanges like you can follow up over on the right i'm going to follow up on the left So this game is going to be very much coming down to who can count better. It's like, who is actually correct in which one of these moves is larger? And how are you going to follow up? So it's very interesting. Black responds in a very unusual manner. Once again, we see someone who's not really, <laughs> not really a Taisha either, sorry. But we see someone who's not really trying to defend one of his stones, has the option of defending either of them. I mean, we could follow up on the bottom if white attacks the left. If white falls up on the left, we can follow up on the left-hand side. Or if white falls up on the right, sorry, then we can follow up on the left-hand side. It's pretty good to go. Nice and flexible. We can do whatever we want. White says, okay. I'm going to split you on the make certain you can't keep me low. Which is a very good choice. Because if white responded somewhere over on the right-hand side, for example, this is insanely severe. I mean, we're not going to get a happy position onto this. We know that immediately. This is not even, I mean, just looking at a really, really tiny corner at best is what we can hope for here. That's no good. That's no, 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 no. We can't let ourselves be surrounded that way. Clearly, the right-hand side is the wrong decision. So white splits, which means black gets to follow up and potentially develop the bottom. Cool. But now look what we have. We have white with a lot of stones on the left-hand side. We have black. Stone's not dead. 
tons of algae there. Meanwhile, black's development on the right-hand side, but white has stones there, so there's algae. So it's really hard to say who's going to be getting what this game. That's what makes this so interesting. If you're looking to find the large moves in a game, yeah, you can look at a move at a game where they're all playing, you know, gote moves to expand this framework or reduce that or whatever. But I think these are pretty good uh, lesson in just finding the larger points as well. Because it might actually show you that there's large points that you didn't even realize. Like you might have thought, okay, if I'm approached, I have to do this. But you don't. You do have options there. You're not locked into just, you know, playing a Jiseki when your corner is approached, then taking Sente and approaching a corner and playing a Jiseki there, and then whoever gets Sente from that is going to approach yet another corner where another Jiseki is going to be played, and we're all going to have even results all over the board. You do have options. You do have options. Though, if you're going to play this way, I recommend being as close to Dom level as possible. Because this crap does get complicated. So white follows up with a kick. Does R3 work? Uh, if you're going to follow it up with O5, then it might. You can still make you can still make shape here, which is one of the reasons why black immediately ignores the kick to surround the corner. So holy crap, are we having uh, exchanges being made? So far, we're having the entire left side of the board being exchanged for the entire right side of the board. So it's a really fun game. Like, who knows where this is actually going next? I certainly had no idea when I was first looking at it. Because, I mean, surely about now is when white might want to get something else on the right. Yeah, maybe, maybe some kind of some kind of approach at R14, maybe? Just so he has a stone there, but no, no, no. He's just going to keep playing on the left and taking advantage of the stones that Black hasn't defended. So now it's just a question of, well, what's Black going to do? Because I have no fracking idea anymore. Hmm. Kathleen Taranu. He's cool. I've played him before. Uh, so yeah, what is white going to do? Mm, I did fairly well. I lost, but I did okay. So, here we have to decide as black, what are we going to do? Are we actually going to extend? Are we taking a larger move? Are we going to, I don't know, are we going to just reduce? I mean, one thing that I would honestly consider recommending to a student, if I was looking at this game, I would look at this and be like, okay, you're kicked in two different spots. I mean, I guess one thing you can do is just cap, and whichever way white doesn't defend, then try and bring out that stone. That way we can use something here. And I think, that's an, I think that's an okay idea. I think that's really an okay idea. Looking at that, it, it doesn't seem that bad to me. It might, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm really, really wrong. But black extends. To which white's going to follow up. Large, large follow up. Because this move is saying, you know what? This is going to be mine. And the upper left corner is going to be mine. And if you're dumb enough to run those two stones out, I'm going to follow you along the top of the board, and that's going to be mine as well. So go ahead, punk, what you want to do. Scary question. I, mean, I don't want to bring out those two stones right now. I mean, I can just envision this like huge top board going to white. But, he does it. He brings out his stones. So White's like, alright, I'll develop over here. <sighs> I 
All right, this is where I troll, troll just all of you. How do you follow this up? How do you follow this up? This is insane. We're behind enemy lines, potentially, in one move. We can be enclosed. We can be kept in. What do we do? Do we just keep running? Tanuki! Tanuki! Uh, E16... And then... Wait, E and then... Oh, and then C17. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's a good thing to know, that you still have that that because he responded in the way that he did, there's a lot of Aji there in the corner. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you mentioning that RJM might be one of the reasons he decides to Tanuki and just play elsewhere. Why not? Large point, sure. We've only got three stones under severe attack. Who cares? Why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah, as a Tanuki, it's very good. It's, it's, it is working with his stones. I mean, this wants to develop, and that's developing, and we're getting territory, and there's only the entire left-hand side of the board that's under attack. I mean, that's, that's clearly the right way to, uh, the right time to develop that. Sure, why not? White continues developing, and threatens an attack now. A new attack, rather on both H4 as well as completely swallowing half of the board if we get another move in the middle. So this, I don't want to count this. This is the kind of game that requires counting what, what do we need to do. And some players really, really love counting. I've, I've had students that always wanted to know the numbers behind everything. Like how many points is this worth? How many points is that worth? Uh, this extension over that extension, this invasion at this time, is that worth more points than this over here? It's like, I'm not that kind of a player, actually. I don't know Don levels players who are those kinds of players. But this is kind of the kind of game that that requires. So for all of those who love counting, congratulations. You're probably going to find this game a lot of fun. Those of you who don't, never play this way ever because it might be a headache. Suffice it to say, we have a choice. We can defend our group in the middle, but then H4 is going to get attacked, and we can't really run away with it, can we? Because if we run away with H4, and we've got a group up top that's weak, then what's going to happen? We're going to have two weak groups, and I, I vaguely recall something bad happening to us whenever we create two weak groups. So white defends, or black defends, someone defends. I don't know anymore which color is which. So right away, we've got white trying to take the left-hand side, and black trying to take the bottom. So weirdly enough, even though we can't count, we've, we're pretty good at estimating, right? And we can kind of estimate that fourth line territory up into the corner it's about the same as this that we have over on the left-hand side that you can't see my mouse on if you are not watching the bottom of this. That's kind of about the same as this side, and the upper right enclosure is about the same as the upper left enclosure. So we might not know what the score is exactly, but we can kind of see that this is still pretty even, right? It's just a giant question mark as to what happens to the three cells on the left. So white moves to answer that immediately. White says, the stones on the left are going to be dead, and I'm going to try to kill them. Or I'm going to develop the top, and I'm going to be fine with that as well. It's up to you, black, on how you want to move. Black says, I'm going to try and escape. And white says, are you serious? How is that ever going anywhere? Black says, one move at a time. To which white says, but what if I play two moves at a time? That's, that's definitely a very good question, because it looks like we're not breaking out of here anymore now, are we? And we're giving lots of influence to our opponent. 
So how do we get out of this mess? Because right now we're kind of feeling like we're 30Q. There's got to be something here for us. Otherwise, our moves are just bad. And it can't be living locally. Simply living, simply living locally, too many L's in that sentence, is not enough. If we just go and make two points right here, we might as well resign. Because you know what White's going to do, right? White's going to play move like 017 or something and just take influence up the entire middle of the board? Wow, that would be painful. That would... No, we don't like that at all. So try and wrap your head around this. White pushes out, right? Or black does. Again, I have no idea. White plays the Hane. <laughs> I got that one right that time. Black responds. But white doesn't cut. Why doesn't white cut? Oh, already said it. Problems with H15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we were to actually um, play here instead, for example, and we attach... Uh, we got a little bit of an issue here now, because how do we how do we respond? Do we just connect? Now we can potentially cut through. That's kind of no good. We play here nice and strong, that way the top is secure. But truth of the matter is, white doesn't mind this. Because is white, is black still alive right now? No. So if we just make our stone strong, and if black is still struggling, that's got to be good for us, right? I mean, he's not alive. He's got a group that's weak, that's struggling and have to go somewhere. So how can that possibly be bad for us? Us being white right now. If we as white, if we as white has a weak group that we can attack, that's unsettled, that there's still plenty of open space on the board for development, then why not? Why not? Black turns, white's like, okay, I'll just solidify this as well. Black plays a Hane, white responds with a double, makes certain that this bottom area doesn't grow too large. Sure, makes perfect sense. Connects. Extends, white follows, because again, you're not alive yet. So, I don't care. Extends, kills off one stone, that's pretty profitable. Immediately, white finds himself getting poked. Black is through responding passively and wants to make certain that all of his influence that, yeah, his uh, shape point is being poked. Because Black is trying to make certain, yes. Because Black is making certain that all of this influence is not going to be just developed easily. Okay, makes, whoops. Makes sense. Hi, ahead of two and three stones, so we know this is going to be responded to. Sentai might as well. Three move. Three moves are good. Attach to get stronger. Have to keep in mind that there's a cutting point down below. Black does not Hane. Interesting. So white moves to just completely continue surrounding. And continue surrounding. But there's a uh, Aji with those two space, so let's try to shore up that first. And now we have something interesting. Now we have something interesting. We have a move that we can't possibly respond to. We cannot respond to that, can we? Because 
if we respond to that and white gets to play on top again, can we still cut through that two space extension? Because if we can't, then those four stones we just played are dead and we're looking really stupid. Black plays away. White says, all right, I guess the left is in fact mine. And black says, all right, I guess the right is now mine. So remember what this was all about. This was all about exchanges. I played these two uh, games, or I'm going over these two games rather, because I thought the exchanges that were made in them were just completely interesting. So the first game, we have something that we usually see in all of our games. Maybe uh, one stone in exchange for something else. Here we're seeing, oh, so much more. So, so, so much more. We're seeing entire sides of the board given up in exchange. This is why I mentioned that usually when we get into these kind of games, your counting has to be spot on. Otherwise, you might find yourself giving up too much for too little or, you know, other way around. So yeah, left side's gone. White says, that's mine now. And black says, okay, well, the right's mine. So what a bizarre game that turned into. I mean, from here, it, I mean, we're completely locked out. I, I guess we have to reduce because I, I granted, I didn't count this because I'm lazy, but just vaguely, just vaguely, uh, without counting, I can understand that uh, fifth line territory, uh, not quite as large as um, um, yeah, not not quite, not quite as large. I don't think. I think maybe this might be a little bit more for black than it is for white. So white has to reduce this, and as R. James pointing out. Uh, white is more territorial. This so open, something surely can be done in here. So white says, well, what about the 3-3? Three, three? That's a good place to start. So white makes the initial moves. Might have co in here. Or he might have a super, super aggressive variation where black doesn't go for ko, but he goes for kill. Before that, we poke. Defends. And gets an attack going in. It's like, how is this going to be how is this going to be handled? If these stones die, well, then that's that's pretty good. That uh, even things up mighty quick. Black says, no, I'll attach in the most vulgar manner possible. I'm going to connect by whatever means necessary. Not going to try any diagonal shenanigans. Not going to do any weird things with F4 fracket. I'm just connecting and I'm going to live. Because if these die, that's just game over. Yep. The captured stone is not going to be worth that much. What's more important is just connecting up by any means necessary. White moves to live. Now he might have a potential co in the top. White asks, can I live here as well? Black pulls back nice and strong to make certain that he can immediately remove any kind of uh, base that he's trying to get. White tries to enlarge the base in Sente. Now, there's a nice problem for you. It looks like that's actually alive. 
How irritating is that? And those four stones look like they should just be dead. But we can't really see a way to kill them off, can we? S for heartbeat? Not familiar with that word, sorry. Nah, S2 doesn't quite work because you have to drop down. Well, okay, I'm familiar with the word heartbeat. I'm not familiar with it in terms of go, sorry. Oh. Ah, I see. Uh, but no, S2 doesn't quite work either. I can show that in a second. Uh, he decides to do this. Black and white goes there. Uh, if we actually take that up from him, then we have to drop down as well. If we play here, we have to play that. And at this point, we can't really envision a way to kill anything. Nope, but it's, it's really, really quickly going to be the top right. Everything, it looks like it's going to hinge on it. Because the corner was invaded. That's so unfortunate. And black follows up with a attempt of his own. Oh god, sorry that came before. I'm just going to ignore that and pretend that was the correct order of moves. Black tries to live in the corner. Gets a connect. Some forcing moves. White wants Sente again to go back and live or try to live. Again, the corner is attacked because they're all just trying to poke at everything that they possibly can. Because this is now a game of reduction. And believe it or not, black actually gets to live back here. Which is quite enormous. That is a very, very huge success. Black drops down. Um, yoop. And yoop. Then we have to go back and live. For other eye. This was a little bit weird. This took me a minute. I didn't see what was going on here, right? Though RGM, RJM seems to be picking up on it really quick. I thought L, 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 L what is it? L five immediately. But that Hane gets hard to read, doesn't it? If White plays the Hane the next move afterwards, we can't Hane back, can we? Because those stones are going to get cut. And as those stones get cut, they're going to die. So black actually drops down. Because if we played this, then there's a lot of... Whoops. Well, that's Anji too, I guess. There's a lot of Aji here, right? Too much so. Too much so. There's no way you're going to save these stones and prevent the right hand from getting killed. So that right there is a really cool follow-up. And was worth so many points, because black had to back off, white got to come up, and then black had to save himself in the corner, allowing him to go back and connect up here. Black says you're not alive in the corner. White says that's cool, I'm alive here. Black continues, now I'm alive there as well. Well, potentially. Uh, 
Uh, time Suji, this I think, by the way. Before going back and playing the Ko in the corner, which is absolutely enormous. And this turns even larger. All in on this. He decides to bet everything that he can kill here. And when I say everything, um, kind of meaning everything. He connects, doesn't fight it. But by connecting, he's allowing the cut, right? So white gets to cut. This is now worth a bajillion points. Black takes. We're fighting Ko. And black backs off. This is worth a bajillion points again. White moves to live. Black is still going for Ko. White has uh, nice uh, local threats. To which White gets really, really super aggressive. He decides he's connecting up everywhere and going to break out, which is obviously leaving even more Aji behind. So now we're again in code for life, which is a tad ridiculous, not gonna lie. White threatens to kill this. White sees something here instead. Have I, have I lost everyone yet? Are you still following what's going on? No? Essentially, this is worth a million points as everything is threatening to be reduced and or killed. It's a crazy, crazy Ko. One that I wouldn't want to fight ever. I hate Ko. I'm really bad at Ko. And it's worth so much that the left-hand side is being completely broken into as a result. If black gets a good result here, as well as Sente, to actually kill off those stones on the left, then white's got nothing. So white is going completely all in here. He's going to completely destroy this, and thus completely destroy white's, or black's area of territory, maybe even bring L14 back to life, or he's going to resign. There's really not a lot of wiggle room for anything else to happen here. So he extends, black takes, and white realizes, oh, so I'm, there's no more co here, so I have to kill something, clearly. But the question is, do P14 stones really die? Can those stones really die? Ooh, people say yes they do. Oh, Path sees that they don't. Or oh, wait, maybe he don't, I don't know what Path sees anymore. I'm not even sure what Path said. He said, no, wait, yes, don't listen to me. Essentially, if we play Q12, what's the answer? What are, what are we seeing here? Are we seeing this maybe for black? Because if we're seeing this for black, then black's, then white's dead. So Q12 is not working. And because it doesn't work, white resigns.
Nope. White resigned right here. So black bet the actual black bet everything I'm living here. White bet everything I'm breaking out, and it didn't work. It was the last exchange that just too much. Couldn't exchange the left for the entire right hand side. But still, a very cool game to try. I mean, so much was it changed hands this game. Bit of a sad ending, but I do like games like this. Little reminders that, you know, exchanges do come in more than just the one stone that we saw in the beginning and with the first game. They can come on extremely large scales. If your reading is and counting is uh, good enough to actually make the attempt, or if you're just that arrogant into making the attempt. I don't know which one it is. Maybe it's accuracy of reading. Maybe it's just colossal arrogance. Uh, whatever. Whatever works for you. Then uh, entire board can be changed. I mean, because up to here, it was pretty even, right? I mean, nice, nice stable game. Looked like uh, everyone was getting a pretty good result. And then suddenly, blood entered the water, sharks began swimming around, and suddenly the all the left is dead, and now the right's dying, and people are crying, and we don't really know what's happening. All in the space of a few moves, really interesting. I don't know if I would uh, be brave enough to play this way in most of my games, or any of my games, ever. You have to be so certain that what you're making on the right for black here is just so solid that you're going to keep a lot of these points because you're never going to reduce whites. But yeah, very interesting game. I find it very interesting. I hope you guys did as well. I recommend sticking to a bit more of the... Uh, Easier exchange, the whole one stone for something. Try that. Start off slow with just the one stone idea first before you try venturing off into madness such as this. But if you do, have fun with it, and I hope uh, you have lots of luck in your games. At the very least, they will be entertaining. Glad you liked it. Uh, we will be having a, another lesson, as always, week after next. And for those of you who are interested in doing so, you may donate to the lectures. Each lecture is 20 per, 20 USD per. And you're more than welcome to PayPal to my Akari account if you wish to chip in for those. That being said, thank you all for stopping by, and those of you who are watching this later on on YouTube, thank you for watching. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with my next lecture yet. Um, I'm, I'm actually somewhere completely different mentally for my lectures. Uh, I don't know if you guys, how many of you have been around since the beginning, but um, at the end of the year, I've usually been having this kind of thing that I've been doing. In um, where I kind of go over the uh, best games of that year, like any professional games that you really, really liked that I haven't had a chance to go over uh, from that year, or maybe even amateur games that you think are noteworthy. I've kind of been going over those for the last week of December, so I'm trying to think, do I really want to try and do that again? Uh, do I want to do something else? So I'm not really certain what I'm doing with my next lecture or with that last week. So I'd like to do something special to kind of like wrap up the year. I just need to figure out what, though. So when I have all of that nicely planned, I'll be able to tell you what uh, what's coming up next. Yes, that, that is true. Wow, I actually got through a lecture which I did not mess up the tree. Huh. I guess the Mayans were right, and the world is going to end. Wow, that's a bummer. Oh, 
Oh, right, right. The order was wrong. Thank you, honey. Ah, honey boo is our savior. The world is not going to end. I am still ruining trees. As long as that is happening, then the sun will continue to rise. So don't worry, everyone. There will, in fact, be another lecture. Thank you, honey boo. So I will see you all next time. And I hope you all enjoyed.